I love it. I love it. Wow. <laughs> really? I love it. Look at this. This is, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Hey, I'm not surprised. Hey, what's popping, guys? Hope you're doing well, staying blessed, having a good day, having a good week. Hey, guys, instead of me telling you what I said, I want us to go back and listen to what I said at the start of November. So I'm a minus 400 gambler to profit in November, and I would have to agree. I'd have to agree with that. Good luck to the bookie stopping me in November. I wish the bookmaker luck. Like at this point, 8 out of 10 months, I wish the bookie luck. Clean sweep city. And of course, guys, I get it done. Talk the talk, but walk the walk. And that's what real Gs do. I'm a real G. Seven profitable UFC betting months in a row. Nobody puts more time and effort into this game than what I do. And I've got a 15% ROI to show for it. Insane stats. And guys, you can view every single betting month I've had this year without a Money City membership. I've posted all of the links in the description so you can literally look at every bet over every UFC event, every week, every month this year. And all of those are publicly available. So you can go to the description and access all of those bets. So guys, on my last UFC card, I did have a clean sweep. Only made two bets, but both the bets is pure money. And that's seven profitable betting months in a row on the UFC. And I'd like to say for the final month, whether I win or I lose, I'm still the MVP. 15% ROI, that's insane. Guys, let's try and make it eight profitable months in a row for the Patreon gang. And if you want all the bets I'm personally making, like I said, go to the description, check all the past bets, check the Patreon, and I'll see you guys in the Discord for the final cards of this year. And let's go, let's do it. All right, moving into the first matchup on this card, we've got Jamie Lynn Horth taking on Veronica Hardy. And we're gonna start by saying this is quite a low level matchup. So neither of these fighters are going to be fighting for championships. However, the fight is still about proving you're better than the opponent. Whether it's a high-level matchup or a low-level matchup, the objective is still the same. And when I look at this matchup, I kind of favour Jamie Lynn Horth to be the better prediction. You know, the, the right prediction to make. If you look at Veronica Hardy, she kind of relies on her footwork and her speed. She's got some nice spinning techniques, some nice kicks, but overall, it's going to be the speed and technique that really stands out for Veronica. However, guys, in this situation, the opponent does have the physical advantages in terms of height and reach, and she's also not a walking punch bag like Juliana Miller. And guys, Jamie Lynn Horth does have some nice head kicks. And I think Veronica Hardy probably doesn't find the target as much as what she did against Juliana Miller. So my first prediction is going to be Jamie Lynn Horth because I don't see the speed and footwork helping Veronica as much as it did in her most recent matchup. So the first pick is going to be the Canadian Jamie Lynn Horth. All right, moving into a matchup between Wellington Terman taking on Jared Gooden. And this is also quite a low level matchup, just like the fact we just broke down. And we know that because looking at the UFC record of Wellington and Jared Gooden, neither of these guys can afford to lose another fight. It's probably loser leaves town if you lose this matchup. Now, Wellington Terman, in my opinion, does have the better skill set. He's got better jujitsu than Jared Gooden. He's also got better Muay Thai kicks, and he's probably going to be more effective in the clinch as the fight progresses outside of round one. And he's probably got better cardio. So there's quite a few things I like about Wellington for this matchup. The problem with Wellington is he just makes mistakes. You know, he's bad defensively. The chin is kind of dusty and when you combine those things together you become a fighter that can kind of lose the matchup even when you're one round up or two rounds up so i'd say if you're jared gooden remaining in the fight would be key because wellington's gonna make a mistake he's gonna make multiple mistakes and if you're jared gooden you can capitalize on that mistake land a big right hand and you can sleep wellington but like i said it is gonna be loser leaves town and for me i personally like to rely on the better mma skill set and for me that's gonna be the brazilian wellington Terman to win the matchup all right moving into a matchup between ehor pateria taking on rodolfo belotto now this matchup is essentially a matchup that's been put together because both pateria and belotto got signed from the contender so this matchup's really about proving who's the higher quality signing and pateria's already been tested in the ufc and guys i'd have to say that pateria's shown to be quite a low quality fire you know extremely reckless defensively bad offensively bad he did ko a legend in shogun but obviously that's an old man and you'd kind of expect that 
Now, on the flip side, Rodolfo Bellotto isn't an old man. And when you look at his contender series performance, just how impressive was the low kick. The low kick was nasty fast and it's finding the target. And I kind of think if that same weapon is landing against Pateria, that would make Pateria reckless. You know, it kind of force him to adjust his tactics mid-fight. And guys, here's the thing. When you're technically not good, when you're fundamentally not good, it's kind of difficult to overcome adversity. It's really difficult to take control of a fight that you're losing and you haven't got the fundamentals. You know, it's, it's kind of downhill. So for me, it's an easy prediction to make. I do think Rodolfo Bellotto is going to land the calf kick or potentially wrap up Pateria on the mat because Bellotto also has a clear advantage in the jiu-jitsu. So yeah, it does appear to me that Rodolfo Bellotto is the better signing from the contender, and I would expect to see that this weekend in this matchup, so that's my pick. All right, moving into a matchup between Steve Garcia taking on Melk Costa, and this is a very, very good matchup, very good matchmaking. Guys, I think Costa has clear advantages. You know, you look at the beatdown he put on Austin Lingo. I know it's Austin Lingo, nothing special. Nothing to write home about with Austin Lingo. But the performance, you know, it's the performance, guys. And I'd have to say, when you look at the performance Costa put on, it's a beautiful display of Muay Thai kicks. He displayed a great understanding of range and just nasty Muay Thai damage being made in that matchup. Now, one of the clear weaknesses of Steve Garcia would be his defense defensively he's very bad now i did pick him as an underdog against shyland nor dan beckup and he had a massive massive comeback you know especially after being dominated early in the matchup and he did completely dust chase hooper but obviously chase hooper cannot be compared to mel costa you know comparing chase hooper's stand up to what Melk is shown to be capable of on the feet it would you know be very irrational so yeah this is a good matchup and i think you know if steve garcia stays on the feet that's where he's going to lose the fight. You know, he's got to push Costa against the fence or essentially bring Costa to the mat. Because if the matchup stays on the feet, again, I'm looking for Costa to basically show a, a good Muay Thai display. So yeah, give me the Brazilian to find a TKO stoppage. And like I said, if Steve Garcia wants success in this matchup, pushing Melk against the fence or bringing him to the mat, that would be the way to go. But yeah, the prediction is going to be the Brazilian Melt Costa. Moving into a matchup between Joe Selecki taking on Draco Closer. And this is quite a good matchup in terms of skill. Now, initially, I was thinking Draco Closer was an easy prediction to make. However, he has been dealing with an ACL injury, hasn't fought in a year and a half, and he's also 35 years old. After realizing these facts, the bookie could potentially be right that it's somewhat of a pick and matchup. Now, guys, if Joe Selecki is successful at getting Draco closer to grapple, he could be a good underdog that cashes this weekend. However, there is also problems with Joe Selecki. His striking isn't that effective, and his cardio is also proven to be bad after about 10 minutes. Now, guys, if Joe Selecki can't get the grappling going late, and he's now forced to strike, and Joe Selecki is also tired, this is going to be a really, really bad look in terms of optics, and the judges are not going to be scoring that for Joe Selecki. So guys, overall, factoring in as much information as possible, I do believe Draco Closer is still the prediction to make. Essentially, I think his wrestling is good enough to keep the match up on the feet, and from there, you just go to work with the boxing. His striking is much better than Joe's. So just outbox the opponent. Guys, I may bet Draco closer, but obviously with the layoff and the ACL injury and the fact he's 35, it's kind of off-putting. But the prediction is going to be Draco closer. All right, moving into a matchup between Cody Brundage taking on Zach Reese. Now, guys, everybody knows that Cody Brundage is an absolute dosser and he shouldn't be in the UFC. Everybody knows that. However, if you're Zach Reese and you've just made it to the UFC via the contender, you really have to prove something that everybody already knows. And it's exactly what I just said. The fact Cody Brundage is a dosser. Because guys, if Zach Reese doesn't prove that, now we've got two dossers, right? And that's not a good thing for Zach Reese. Zach Reese has had six professional fights and all six are round one stoppages. Cody Brundage is there to be stopped. Even if it's not a round one stoppage, you can easily beat Cody outside of round one when his cardio turns to dust. So give me Zach Reese to find a stoppage, either round one or round two. All right, moving into a matchup between Misha Tate taking on Julia Avila. And I kind of love this matchup, I'm not going to lie. And it's kind of the matchups you lack and love that you feel there's money to be made on. Not always, right? Sometimes you get some matchups that are really high level and it's super difficult to pick. 
and you don't make a wage up and you still love those matchups. But in this situation, I do feel like there's money to be made potentially. It all comes down to your own risk assessment of the matchup, your own prediction of the chances both Avila and Misha Tate have. Now guys, I've watched tape this week on Misha Tate. I've watched her past performances and like George St. Pierre once said, I'm not impressed by your performance. 100% not impressed. Guys, Misha Tate on the feet. It's almost like I'm watching Paul Craig's sister. Offensively terrible, defensively terrible, footwork stuck in the mud, her guard is wide open. It's so bad for Misha Tate on the feet. And on the flip side, I'm watching Julia Avila front kicking Stolyarenko in the face. I'm watching Avila put together nice combinations, just a massive difference in what both fighters are offering on the feet. So guys, based on that, I'm gonna say if Misha Tate isn't sticking Avila against the fence, or bringing her to the mat, if the fight looks any different, I don't expect Misha Tate to do well in this matchup. Now guys, Julia Vila has taken time away from the cage, right? It's been over two and a half years, and that's because she had a kid. So the amount of time taken off, the fact she's had a kid, and the fact she's 35, those are things to think about. So you would have to factor that information into the chances you give Julia Vila this weekend. But guys, for me, I'm still siding with Julia Vila. I just think if Misha Tate isn't wrestling, like what's she going to be doing? Is she going to be landing impactful strikes? I doubt it. It's push Avila against the fence or bring her to the mat. If it's not that, I see Avila just, just dusting Misha Tate. I don't officially have a bet on Avila at the moment, but she might be my fourth bet. If you waited to smoke with me, amen. You've been smoking this whole time, double amen. If you're not a smoker, but you enjoy the smoke breaks, it's always been a triple amen, gang. Let's go. Now, guys, just a few mentions from a last UFC card. Trey Ogden. Obviously, anybody that bet Trey Ogden, you made a great bet. And hopefully, Trey Ogden got his win money. I still forgot to check that, but... Yeah, the ref earned a perfect performance by Trey Ogden. Slick performance, the jab. It was money. Now, Jekka Saragi blasting Lucas Alexander into another dimension. That was hilarious. And it's great evidence why you shouldn't turn your back to the opponent. Now, obviously, fighters aren't made to pay for it in that manner often. But in this case, get dusted. Guys, Christian Leroy Duncan striking in round two. Something out of a video game. Super nasty. And Jose Johnson did get it done, but... Still got to find a performance where you can defend a takedown just once. Now, Joe Anderson Brito stopping Jonathan Pierce after Jonathan Pierce said, Get up and do something. Oh, he did. Oh, he did. Get dusted. You know, there's levels to getting dusted. There's levels, but when a fighter says, Get up and do something, and then they do, that's a high level of getting dusted. Amanda Rebas with the spinning wheel kick to find a late stoppage dusted and paul craig getting dusted it was expected you know great performance by all in brendan allen in all areas you know not just the grappling but the striking the boxing the footwork all of it all right guys let's go all right moving into a matchup between punahele soriano taking on dustin stoltz first and guys should we just keep it short and simple punahele soriano should dust Dustin Stoltzfus. I'm watching tape on Dustin Stoltzfus, guys, and I'm asking myself, why on earth is this guy in the UFC? Striking-wise, it looks like he's sparring, and you don't really want to bet fighters like that. Essentially, I think Dustin is poor at causing damage, and the aim of the game is to cause damage. Now, guys, the only possible and logical way that Dustin Stoltzfus should find success with this matchup would to be outgrapple Soriano, but even outgrappling Soriano just doesn't seem likely. I think Dustin Stoltzfus is a guy waiting to be cut from the UFC. Punahela Soriano got dusted by Kopolov, but I did take Kopolov as an underdog. I expected his straight punches to beat the wide punches, the wide hooks of Soriano. And that was the case. But in this situation where Dustin Stoltzfus isn't anywhere near as technical as Kopolov, I would lean towards Soriano's hook-heavy style being very effective and probably find a KO TKO. So give me Punahele Soriano to dust. Dustin Stoltzfus. Moving into a matchup between Clay Guida taking on Joachim Silva. And guys, here's the thing. Clay Guida is massively past his prime. And I'd say Silva is also past his prime, but not as much as Clay Guida. So if you're somebody that likes to bet fighters closer to their prime than their opponent, in that case, the bet to make is Silva. But yeah, guys, personally, I'm not going to advise betting Silva at minus 350. Let's say Clay Guida had the wrestling game plan. 
you know, doesn't want to exchange with the opponent, doesn't want to exchange in the pocket. He just wants to make the fight all about wrestling. In that situation, in that scenario, Clay Guida is kind of a live underdog. And the problem with Clay Guida is obviously, you know, at 41 years old, his reactions are gone. His ability to see the punches coming his way and to react, it's, it's gone from his game. And that's dangerous because if you can't react to the strikes coming your way, you're basically guaranteed brain damage. So if you're somebody who's going to bet Clay Guida at plus 250, I'd say just pray that Guida has the wrestling game plan because that way you don't have to watch your underdog bet turn to dust because Guida essentially has blind man defense on the feet. Now guys, I'm going to side with Clay Guida. I'm going to make that pick, but I'm not going to make that bet. You don't get a 15% ROI betting on 41-year-olds. Now, guys, if Clay Guida's got the right game plan this weekend, and the game plan is Wrestle City, you know, less wrestle, kid, less wrestle. If that's the game plan, don't be shocked to see Clay Guida win. If that's not the game plan, and the game plan is to stand and strike, then he's going to go to Shadow City. He's going to get dusted. But yeah, the prediction is going to be the underdog, no bet. All right, moving into a matchup between Sean Brady taking on KG. And this is a very, very interesting matchup for multiple reasons. And we're going to get straight into those reasons. The first reason is Sean Brady's coming off his first professional loss. He lost to Bilal Muhammad in a fight where Bilal stayed on the pressure and essentially outboxed Sean Brady until Sean just couldn't throw anything back. Secondly, KG is always a good test for anybody at any point in their UFC career. And guys, thirdly, Calvin Gaslam is returning to 170 welterweight where he originally started his UFC career. So it's also a test for KG to essentially let people know, look, Bilal Muhammad handed Sean Brady his first loss. I'm back at welterweight and I'm going to hand Sean Brady his second loss and back to back. It's a very interesting matchup. I think Sean Brady is a guy that would prefer to use his jiu-jitsu rather than his boxing. If Brady can implement his grappling, he's always better in that type of matchup. As we saw against Bilal Muhammad, there's no grappling from Sean Brady and he kind of turns to dust under the pressure of Bilal Muhammad. And guys, KG's a fighter that's comfortable anywhere the matchup goes. Wrestling, boxing, jiu-jitsu, it doesn't matter. KG's a fighter that will show his level anywhere the matchup goes. And this is why he's a great test for anybody at any point in their UFC career. It's always a good win if you can beat KG. Now guys, if the matchup stays on the feet, I think the range would be important. The pace would also be important. The fight would be a better fight for KG if he could fight at a higher pace and stay in the pocket. Essentially force Sean Brady to feel the same type of boxing pressure that Bilal Muhammad implemented and made him experience. However guys, I'm not sure that KG is going to be able to do what Bilal Muhammad did with the pressure. So for that reason, I'm slightly favouring Sean Brady, but it's a, it's a tough pick. Guys, it's going to be a no-bet situation for me. It's going to be interesting to see how Brady responds to that first loss. It's also going to be interesting to see KG move back to 170. It's a good matchup. I'm slightly favouring Sean Brady. Moving into a matchup between Rob Font taking on Davis and Figueredo, an unbelievable matchmaking by the UFC. And with Figueredo moving up from flyweight to bantamweight, there's so many good matchups to happen for Figueredo, depending on how this matchup goes. Because if he beats Rob Font, then you're looking at matchups higher up the weight class. And if he loses to Rob Font, then obviously there's matchups lower down the rankings. But let's focus on this matchup for now. Guys, what an unbelievable matchup. Rob Font is primarily a boxer and a phenomenal one too. His jab, his one two, the hooks, it's all technically brilliant stuff from Rob Font. He did get completely ragdolled by Corey Sandhagen, but Figueredo probably won't implement the same game plan, or at least not until he's forced to level change if Rob Font starts to get the better of Figueredo on the feet. Now guys, Figueredo's got a wide stance, and he's definitely got power in the right hand, but the weakness of Figueredo at times it's kind of his recklessness. It's kind of his cardio. It became a real issue at flyweight. So moving up to bantamweight should help his cardio a bit. Probably not by much. Because at the end of the day, your energy expenditure is the biggest controller of your cardio. And of course, the bad weight cuts don't help. And I'm sure moving up to bantamweight should help. But if Figueredo's throwing heat, there's only so much of that heat that you can throw until you start to feel the fatigue. So guys, if you're Figueredo, you've got to fight smart. 
you know, look to kick the legs of Rob Font, look to cause problems for the boxer before you really start to engage in the boxing. And the two ways I see Figueredo doing that would be to get your kicks going or even make it a grappling match, you know, look to implement your jiu-jitsu because your jiu-jitsu is better than Rob Font's. Just look to cause problems for the boxer early in the fight because if Rob Font finds his range and finds his rhythm with the boxing, then it could start to be a really bad night for Figueredo. Essentially, I think Figueredo has to keep Rob Font from finding that range, finding his rhythm, finding the boxing rhythm. And I do think he can do that. So give me the underdog, Davis and Figueredo. It's not an easy pick. Moving into the co-main event and an unbelievable co-main event. We've got Bobby Green taking on Jalen Turner. And my goodness, what a difficult pick to make. And guys, I have made my mind up. I know who I'm going to pick. But what a matchup. Now, Jalen Turner is a fighter that's naturally gifted. He's got the physical advantages. His boxing is technically sharp. And his jiu-jitsu, specifically the guillotine choke, is super dangerous. However, there is a couple problems with Jalen Turner. Firstly, his striking defense is kind of bad. But it doesn't really show until later in the fight. And that's his problem. When the fight actually becomes a fight meaning the opponent hasn't folded early in round one. That's really where Jalen Turner starts to crumble. You know, once he actually feels like it's a fight, he just doesn't recover. It's kind of downhill for Jalen Turner once he realizes, look, this opponent's not going to go away. And that's what you saw with Dan Hooker. However, Dan Hooker's the type of fighter that will sense the fatigue and actively turn it up, start to really pour on the pressure, almost like a shark that smells blood, right? But... Bobby Green is more relaxed. Bobby Green's more of a gangster, right? The type of fighter that would rather fight on the back foot and just kind of outbox you and actively speak to you while the boxing exchanges unfold. So I kind of think because of that, Jalen Turner's going to be more in a technical fight that suits him. It's when the fight's ugly. That's where Jalen Turner just turns to dust. And guys, styles make fights. Styles have always made fights. So give me Jalen Turner on short notice wasn't an easy prediction to make but i do think the style of the matchup kind of suits Jalen turner like i said Jalen turner turns to dust when the fight turns ugly but bobby green's more relaxed he's not like a shark that smells blood all right moving into the main event arman sarukian taking on benil darush unbelievable matchmaking it's a matchup that does seem necessary and guys i'm a believer that arman sarukian will one day be a ufc lightweight champion as of right now it's islam makashev's time but eventually i do see arman sarukian having his time this weekend though it's a case of arman sarukian cleaning out the top of the weight class proving to the ufc the fans and to himself that his opponent benil darush has passed his prime and should drop down the rankings because of that and to prove that of course he would have to be victorious in his second ufc main event after getting robbed by the judges in his first UFC main event against Gamrot. Now, obviously, Benil Darouche is looking to upset the rising prospect. He's looking to prove he's still good enough to be in the mix for the title shot. Benny has outstanding jiu-jitsu, but father time's undefeated. It's undefeated. Every dog has their day, and it seems to me that Benny's day is it's over. Guys, I took Oliveira to beat Benny as an underdog and I'm even higher on Armin Sarukian overall as a mixed martial artist than what I am on Oliveira. To give me the Muay Thai specialist and outstanding grappler Armin Sarukian to stop Benny at some point in this weekend's main event. Guys, like I said, Benny's got outstanding jujitsu but I don't think he can get Armin to the mat I think Harmon could get Benny to the mat if he wanted and he might do that as Benny slows down as the fight progresses. And on the feet, obviously Benny's got some, you know, some nice attacks. The punches come from weird angles. The kicks are good. Spinning attacks. But I think this will last for about five minutes at most. And then Armin's Muay Thai, the kicks. Oh, he's going to dust Benny. I think he stops him. I think Armin stops him. As always, guys, let me know you're taking in the main event, the co-main event, your straight bets, your parlays, your money city bets. Drop all that in the comment section below. And as always, keep your eyes to the sky and never glue to your shoes. Peace.